This is the Bible. It is the Word of God. It is true, and I believe it. This book is filled with hope and promise for my life, now and for eternity. I'm ready to receive what God has for me from His Word. In Jesus' name, amen. The last couple of weeks, I've been talking about uh, faith that triggers grace as uh, people in Jesus' presence uh, demonstrated faith and that released grace from him into their lives. Today, I want to take a look at a, a little different angle of that. Grace that encourages faith. When God gives grace to us, it's not just to us. He gives grace to us that it would flow through us and touch other people's lives as well. And when that happens, their faith is strengthened. Their faith, well, there are people who come to faith because of grace that flows through us. And there are people who are of faith who grow in their faith because of the grace of God flowing through his followers. I want to look at... Uh, did I tell you where to turn yet? Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. And uh, we're going to take a look at an individual in particular who I am very fond of because he's just such an exemplary uh, person in Scripture. Several years ago, somebody asked me, outside of Jesus, who's your favorite Bible character? And I thought for about 15 seconds, and I said, well, I think it'd be Barnabas. I mean, there are lots of heroes in the Bible, but I think it'd be Barnabas. And he went, who's Barnabas? <laughs> well, Barnabas is a guy we see often, but not big pictures of, little pictures of. And uh, Barnabas is a name that means son of encouragement. It was his nickname. It was his, nick his name was Joseph. Uh, and it turns out he was really just a regular Joe who had extraordinary grace flowing through him. So I like Barnabas. It was the nickname that the apostles gave him. They called him Barnabas because he was the son of encouragement. The grace that flowed through him encouraged others. And so when Barnabas would show up, when Joseph would show up, they knew this is going to be a good day. This guy's going to boost us. This, God is going to change things because this guy showed up and he is a conduit for the grace of God. If you're following in your bulletin, there's a, an outline there. Uh, things that are components of grace or results from grace. I'm going to read from Acts chapter 4, just the last two verses, 36 and 37, as we begin. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. First thing I want us to notice about grace is grace gives. Grace gives. God has been gracious to us. He has given us more than we deserve. He has given us not what we deserve, but better than what we deserve. He has given and given generously. And because grace does that to us, it also does that through us. As we let the grace of God flow through us, we are able to give. We're able to give because... It's not ours to begin with. Joseph owned a field. It says it was his field to sell. He owned it and he sold it. But he knew, I've given my life to Christ. All that I have, all that I am, is his. So he was just managing it. He was stewarding it. And he decided it was more profitable in the kingdom at that moment to cash in that field and distribute it to the church. There was a financial need, and he sold the field. Now, it doesn't say that there was a general call, hey, everybody sell your field. It doesn't say that there was a general call or even a specific call to any individual, sell everything you have. No, he saw a need, apparently. He sold the field. I don't know how many fields he had. I don't know if this was just the back 40 and that didn't touch the rest of the 500. I don't know what. We don't, we're not told. But we do know he saw a need. 
he saw how good God had been to him. He says, well, I've got a field I can sell. It may have been his last field. We don't know. Or it may have been part of the estate, and he sold it off, said, hey, I can be a blessing here. And he took the proceeds from that sale and brought it to the apostles and said, here it is. Use it however. Uh, <clears throat> now, interestingly, the apostles did not, that we know of, put up a sign on the door of the church saying, this door was paid for by Barnabas. That used to be one of my, I guess it probably still is, one of my uh, irritations that we have all these memorial plaques on things. And, um, you know, today we're going we're gonna to celebrate the memorial that the church has. We remember Christ in this. Now, a friend, a wise friend, helped me through that a little bit. I used to choke on, and, and I fought with him about it, uh, because the church we were in at the time wanted to receive some money for a memorial library, but it was remembering somebody who wasn't in the kingdom. And I struggled with that, much less, I mean, even if they were in the kingdom. That, it's not our name that should go on the door. It's Jesus' name that should go on the door. And I, I was struggling with it, and my, and my wise friend said, read Hebrews 11 tonight, and let's talk about that tomorrow. Hebrews 11 is the hall of faith in the Bible. And it talks about all these great people who did great things, and we remember them, and we know them by name. Okay, there is a place to remember names and to honor those great people uh, of faith. Um, but <clears throat> when we serve communion, when we celebrate communion, it is the memorial service of the church. We remember Christ. He said, do this in remembrance of me. Barnabas gave not so that his name would be known. He gave because there was a need. Now it's recorded for us, and it's a very brief little, little bit. But it's recorded, and that means that people were encouraged. It made a difference for people. It, it spurred people on. Now, some people, if you continue reading chapter 5, didn't do the best with it afterwards. Uh, but on, on Barnabas's part, he was generous. He gave the money. No strings attached. We've probably all had gifts given to us that came with strings. Things that, oh, this is yours if you. Now, some strings are, are, are more constrictive than others. Uh, I've got one of my brothers. Um, in fact, we're going to go to his son's wedding in a couple weeks. Uh, his... His wife was offered by grandma, this, this son's great-grandmother, when he was born, certain jewelry from the family collection if she named him, I don't know what it was, something. <laughs> and she decided the jewelry just wasn't good enough for that name. I can't remember what the name was. <clears throat> I've never been able to bribe uh, either my wife or my... In fact, Lisa has often told my boys that they owe her a debt of gratitude because neither of them are named Barnabas. Because I like the name Barnabas because I like the character Barnabas. And I don't even have any grandsons named Barnabas. And Lisa has told them they owe her a debt of gratitude uh, for that. I'm still lobbying. There's another one on the way. And uh, I've been told it's not going to happen, but that hasn't stopped me from... from trying to be influential, in the best sort of way, with no strings attached. <laughs> but if he's not Barnabas, God gives with no strings attached. God gives not, if you'll do this, I'll do that. God gives. Jesus went to the cross knowing there would be people who would reject the gift. He gave anyway. When we give like God gives, we'll give with no strings attached. And yes, we'll have some expectations, just because that's our, our nature. We'll expect people to notice the gift, acknowledge the gift, be grateful for the gift. That won't always happen. Give anyway. Give anyway. The grace of God looks like that. When we give like God gives, 
that's, that's what grace looks like. So when we trust God as our source, we're able to give like God gives. If we know that God is my source, if I, if I have that confidence, it's not my field, it's God's field. Well, then I can sell it and give the proceeds to those in need, and, and I'm no less for it. I've just been stewarding God's stuff. Grace gives. Barnabas gave. Example of grace. Secondly, grace risks. You know, this, this life of faith is risky. And, um, and if you want to turn over to Acts chapter 9... <clears throat> Acts chapter 9, we have the record of Paul, Saul, as he was known before, meeting Jesus on the road to Damascus. And he gets saved. Up until this time, he's been a persecutor of the church. And then he's going to Damascus with a letter from the, from the temple leaders in Jerusalem to arrest and imprison. He's even had people killed. Anyone who are followers of Jesus. He's on his way to Damascus to accomplish that task when Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, meets him on the road, stops him in his tracks, calls him to change, to turn, and he surrenders. We have, sometimes, you may have had somebody talk about a Damascus Road experience. They're referring to Paul's conversion, this dramatic confrontation with Jesus where Jesus says, you're on the wrong path. Turn around. Some of you, that's what it took for you to get saved. A Damascus Road experience. Paul was blinded and uh, then led into the city where somebody prayed for him and he received his sight. And then he proclaimed Jesus. He was no longer an enemy of the church. He was a proponent of the church. He was building the church. And then towards the end of the chapter, Barnabas comes into the story. So in verse 26, when he, meaning Paul, came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples. But they were all afraid of him. Well, yeah, because when he left, he was arresting people and going on a mission to arrest more. Not believing that he really was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul <clears throat> on his journey, had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of, the, of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He talked and debated with the Hellenistic Jews, but they tried to kill him. When the believers learned this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. Living by faith is risky. Because it puts you in contact with people like Saul, who's newly saved. And Saul, who's newly saved, <clears throat> is too close to being Saul, who's not yet saved, in the minds of those who haven't seen him yet. And so they are, they're keeping their distance. They're not letting, it's just a ruse. He's trying to call us out so he can arrest us. That was their thinking. And they were justified in thinking that. Barnabas, grace of God flowing through Barnabas, just a regular Joe, but God's using him in phenomenal ways. He says, you know what? I believe that when God saves, people change. That God really does make a difference in people's lives. They are no longer who they used to be, but God is transforming them and making them something new. Grace risks those things. Grace will take the risk. Not only does grace give, but grace risks. Because we trust God to change people. Now Saul needed changing. He needed a lot of changing. And God did it in a dramatic way. <clears throat> As we, we know that Paul turns out to, to plant churches all over the, the known uh, empire, the Roman Empire, and he writes what turns out to be uh, over a dozen books, 13 of the, of the books of the New Testament. But before all that, the church was saying, we're not so sure about this guy. We're not convinced this guy has really gotten a hold of God or God has really gotten a hold of him. But Barnabas 
allows the grace of God to flow through him and takes the risk. Barma says, this may cost me my life. Or it may, I may end up in prison. But I'm going to believe that God's at work here. And he takes the ri- grace risks. Turns out to be a good risk. Because God was in it. Now Barnabas, being full of faith, is trusting God and God is guiding him. He's not doing this in his own power. It is the grace of God flowing to Barnabas and through Barnabas. Just think if Barnabas or someone like him had not been there. Would we have half of the New Testament? Would the gospel have gotten out through the Apostle Paul into the whole region, uh, well, and beyond the local region, throughout the whole empire? God used Barnabas, a regular Joe, to do extraordinary things because of the grace flowing through him. Every time we take a risk... In faith, allowing the grace of God to flow through us, we give God a chance to be glorified. If we manage risks and keep things safe, it's really tough for God to be glorified out of that because then we've done what we can do. But when we risk going beyond what we can do, what we can control, then God gets the credit. He gets the glory. Grace risks. And turn over another couple of chapters, <clears throat> chapter 13, and, um, and actually the story begins in, in chapter 11, um, in Acts uh, 11, I'm going to start reading in 22, uh, <clears throat> the church has been scattered, news of this reached the church in Jerusalem, uh, the church had gone out into Antioch. Uh, so that gets back to Jerusalem. And they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw the, what the grace of God had done, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. Uh, The disciples were called Christians, first at Antioch. So, grace goes. Grace goes. Barnabas is in Jerusalem, has stayed in Jerusalem. He's from Cyprus. But he stays in Jerusalem because that's where the church headquarters are and that's where he is most effective until they hear about revival up in Antioch. And the apostles say, somebody's got to go out there and check it out, make sure that everything's on track and and that they really are getting the gospel straight. And they send Barnabas. They can trust Barnabas with this assignment. He goes there, sees it is really a, a true revival. Things are going well. Church is getting started. He goes, but I could use help in steering this ship. ship. So he goes to Tarsus, where Saul is, gets Saul, brings him back, Saul had to be introduced to the disciples by Barnabas. And then when his life is threatened, they send him out of town. He goes back to his hometown, Tarsus. And now Barnabas says, we can't have him just sitting in Tarsus. We need him here in Antioch. So he brings him to Antioch. And for over a year, they work together, uh, Barnabas and Saul. And then during that time, continuing on verse 27 of chapter 11, During this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them, named Agabus, stood up and through the Spirit predicted that a severe famine would spread over the entire Roman world. This happened during the reign of Claudius. The disciples, as each one was able, decided to provide help for the brothers and sisters living in Judea. They did so, this they did, sending their gifts to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. Again, Barnabas is one of the trusted ones to take the offering down to those in need. Chapter 12 tells us about Peter. There's a whole different episode in there. But then let's go to the end of chapter 12. Pick it up at verse 25. When Barnabas and Saul had finished their mission of delivering that offering, they returned from Jerusalem, taking with them John, who was also called Mark, uh, 
And now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simon, called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, who had been brought up with uh, Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. And while they were worshiping the Lord, worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. And here we have the first missionary journey, the commissioning for the first missionary journey of Paul and Barnabas, except for at the time they're known as Barnabas and Paul. So, grace goes. Fourth point I want to make is grace goes. Uh, That's the third point, if I'm going to keep track of my numbers here. Grace gives, grace risks, and grace goes. Barnabas was available to go. When they wanted him to go to Jerusalem, well, they wanted him to go from Jerusalem to Antioch, he went. When they wanted him to go from Antioch back to Jerusalem with an offering, he went. Went back to Antioch, and when they wanted him, when God wanted him to go and take the gospel to Cyprus and beyond, he went. Grace goes. Grace is ready to go. When, whenever God says, here's an assignment for you, are you ready to say yes? Or are you saying, that's a great assignment for... And you look around to point somebody else out. I can't tell you how many times, after a Sunday morning message, somebody has come up to me and says, boy, I sure wish so-and-so had been here to hear that today. Well, they weren't. But we were. And there are times when as I'm preparing a message in the week, I have in my mind, oh, I know who needs to hear this. And they're not here on Sunday morning. And I often afterwards think, oh, I know who needs to hear this. I need to hear this. This is, this is God speaking to me. Grace goes. Barnabas was ready, it seems, any time there was an assignment that was inconvenient, oh, you're going to have to do some traveling here. You're going to have to hike over there. You're going to have to... He was in. Because he was surrendered. He trusted God was his source. He knew God was leading in his life. And when it says, and here's a little aside here, that while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. They were worshiping the Lord. And the Holy Spirit spoke. How did the Holy Spirit speak? We're not given the details, but we're given a hint. Now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. They were together, and through the gift of prophecy, the Holy Spirit speaks using one of the individuals, or at least earlier we'd seen that Agabus was a prophet who spoke a word of the Lord, and they moved on it, they acted on it. And here again, and we're not told which one or who, But the Holy Spirit speaks and they receive it as the word from the Lord. We are a Pentecostal church. We believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We believe that the Holy Spirit is still speaking not only to us, but through us to declare the goodness of God to those around. Sometimes it's the plans of God, the details of God. Sometimes it's the glory of God. Various ways the Holy Spirit speaks not only to us, but through us. I hope that we collectively pray and expect on a regular basis that God will speak when we are gathered together to worship the Lord. We come on Sunday morning, I said last Sunday, I'll say it again, I want to say it often, this is a gathering of the saints. This is primarily for believers. Unbelievers are always welcome to come in, But this is for believers because we are here to worship the Lord, our Lord. We've already committed to him. We're already in the family. We are here to worship him. It's during this time that we are receptive and responsive to the move of the Holy Spirit. I hope that we pray and expect the gifts of the Spirit to be active in operation among us. And I know the way many of you are praying is... Boy, I sure hope brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so 
is moved by the Lord to give a message. Not that I want to call anybody a so-and-so, all right? <clears throat> but my prayer is that each of us would be open and ready to be used by God to speak a message. And often when I say that, people sweat a little bit and divert their eyes and they're saying, you're not looking at me. That's, I'm, I'm not. But let's be ready. Because Barnabas was just a regular Joe. In fact, when I was asked, who's your favorite outside of Jesus? Who's your favorite character? And I named Barnabas. Who's Barnabas? Right? His name is not, he's not Moses or David or Paul. He's not Matthew, Mark, or Luke. Barnabas. A lot of people don't know Barnabas, but you do now. I want you to remember Barnabas' name. And if there are any children in your family do soon, <laughs> it's a great choice. It's a great choice. I'm just saying. Can't get my own family to use it. So Barnabas, he goes. He goes. He was available. He was available. <clears throat> Willingness to be used by God may move us from our comfort zone. You know what? If God called me to the Congo right now, my response would be, <laughs> I'm sorry, did I overhear somebody else's conversation? That was not for me, right? Because I'm not going to the Congo. That, that, and I'll just be honest. I'm not crazy about that kind of a call. And, uh, and yet, when God calls, to not go where he calls is going to be more uncomfortable than going where he calls. If I go off on the path that I want instead of the path that he wants, I, I'm not going to improve on the plan of God for my life or for anybody else's. God's plan is always going to be the better plan. And so when I reject something that God is calling me to, I'm rejecting the best deal that's available. I don't want to do that. I want to stay in step with God. But I'll be quick to admit, I'm grateful that he has not called me to the Congo. But he may be calling me down the street to the guy with, uh, with an attitude that every time he drives by, waves at me in an unfriendly way. Uh, and that's not my neighbor. That's just a for instance, all right? <clears throat> I do not have one of those neighbors. I'm grateful. Um, but he may call you to interact with somebody that you'd just rather avoid. He'll call us out of our comfort zone. But the grace of God flowing through you will convince them that God is real. God is good. Fourth, and finally, uh, let's turn over just a couple more chapters to uh, Acts 15. Acts 15, starting at verse 36. Sometime later, Paul, and Barnabas, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back and visit the believers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord. So after the first missionary journey, they get back to Antioch, and then sometime later, Paul says, hey, let's go follow up on them. Let's, let's check them out. Now, I, I don't know, did I read far enough in, in 13 that says that they took John Mark with them? Uh, John Mark went with them as a helper on that first journey. Um, let's go back. All right, verse 37. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them, but Paul did not think it was wise to take him because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and left, commended by the believers to the grace of the Lord. He went through the through Syria and Cilicia, and strengthened the churches. So Paul and Barnabas, Paul owes a debt of gratitude to Barnabas. Barnabas was the guy who brought him into the apostles' inner circle in Jerusalem. Barnabas was the guy who left Antioch to go get Paul when revival broke out and says, hey, come and, come and join me in Antioch and let's build up the church in Antioch. Barnabas has been opening the door, putting his arm around Paul, and now Paul says, look, we should go back, but I'm not taking that quitter Mark with us. Barnabas says, buddy, I'm taking Mark with us. No, we're not taking Mark with us. I'm taking Mark with us. No. And there was such a sharp disagreement 
I like that. That's all it says. It didn't come to blows that we know of. And after a bloody nose and a black eye, they decided they'd go in a different way. I, I don't think it came to that. However, I think the folks around the corner heard the discussion. I think it was pretty heated. No, he's a quitter. He couldn't make it. He is not cut out for this. I'm not dragging dead weight with me on this one. Barnabas says, give the boy a chance. He's young. He's learning. He's, re he's really ready for this. I I'm going to take him. I'm going to trust him. I'm going to take the risk on Mark again. Paul says, I am not doing it. You can go if you want, but I'm going to take a different route. I'll take a different person, too. Somebody I can trust. And they parted company. Ouch. But fourthly, we look at this and we see that grace restores. Grace restores. Mark had bailed on them. Mark had quit. But Barnabas wanted to give him a second chance. Barnabas wanted to give him an opportunity to follow up. To not fail him on the first test, but to give him the retake. And say, you know what? I'm willing to risk it. Grace restores. Barnabas forgave and gave Mark a second chance. And it's interesting, the restoration doesn't stop there. Not only is Mark restored back to Barnabas, we see from Paul's further writings down the road that Paul and Barnabas are restored, and Paul and Mark are restored. Towards the end of his life, Paul says, and send John Mark, I, I need him. By then, Paul trusts him. It took Barnabas giving him the chance to prove that he was trustworthy. Interestingly, the Gospel of Mark was written by John Mark. And I think Barnabas gets a lot of credit for reaching out, putting his arm around Mark and saying, come on, let's go on another trip. Let's see if we can encourage the saints along the way. And Mark grows he receives the grace of God, not directly from Jesus now, but from Jesus through Barnabas. Who's in your circle that needs the grace from Jesus, and Jesus is giving it to you to give to them? Are you full enough of grace to give, to risk, to go, and to restore? That kind of grace. Barnabas was convinced that God was able to take someone who had failed and to restore them to fruitfulness in the kingdom. Maybe you know somebody who, oh, I'm so disgusted, they fell again. They messed up again. Is God giving you grace to extend to them to get them back on their feet and become fruitful again in the kingdom of God? Now, they may not write a gospel. They may not, Mark did. Paul wrote, man, think if Barnabas hadn't been involved in these men's lives, would we have the gospel according to Mark? Would we have the 13 books of the New Testament that Paul wrote? Barnabas plays a key role in demonstrating for us what grace flowing through a life looks like. So the next time you, you have a chance to name somebody, Think of Barnabas. Now, Barnabas was a nickname. The apostles had given to Joe. His name was Joseph, but they called him Barnabas. I like the name Barnabas because of this guy. I also like the name Barnabas because of a Barney I knew. I took a mission trip when I was 21. Short-term mission trip, two weeks. And there was a retired guy, uh, father-in-law of, of one of the organizers of the group. It was a construction uh, trip, and Barney was just a great guy. He was a gentle heart, hard worker, and I, I love the fact, and I was, I was just 21 at the time, and I was not knowing what I was going to do. I was kind of in between stuff, and, and uh, <clears throat> not in school, not at work, not, I was floating. I was floating. But it was really cool to float with a guy named Barney. And Barney was watching some of these people on the team. I think they were 16 or 17 of us on the team. 
And one of them was a Methodist pastor who um, was middle-aged, but he was a preacher, and Barney knew it. And Barney said, after about a week, boy, you know, for a preacher, that guy knows how to work. <laughs> and I wasn't preparing for the ministry or anything at that time, so I thought, well, that was quite a compliment. Later, that day or the next day, I'm with the preacher who says, man, for being an old guy, Barney really knows how to work. That guy's killing us. He's setting the pace. They had this mutual admiration for each other. But Barney, I love working with Barney and watching him and seeing grace flow not only to his life, but through his life. And when I read about Barnabas, I see grace flowing through. Grace flowing through. It was his nickname. What nickname would the apostles give you? If you were hanging out with the apostles today, what would your nickname be? Would it be Barnabas? Son of encouragement? How would they see you and and measure you? Uh, I want to be one who allows the grace of God to flow not just to my life, but through my life. And others are lifted, boosted, encouraged, strengthened. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for being the God who redeems, who rescues. You bring us into your kingdom. But you do more than just save us for our sake. You save us for the world's sake. You save us. You change us. You empower us so that we will represent you to the world and make a difference in our world. God, we want that difference to be made through us. We want your grace to flow through us so that the world will know that you are God and you are good. Father, as we're about to receive uh, communion this morning, we know that that is the ultimate picture of grace flowing from your throne to us. Jesus, you were willing to come and die so that we could live. We want to do more than live. We want to extend that life to others. We want to extend the invitation to receive life to others. And so while we're in an attitude of prayer, if you're here this morning and you haven't received life from Christ, if you have not said yes to Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, that invitation is for you today. You can become a follower of Jesus, a member of the family of God, by simply saying yes to Jesus. I say simply, it's a, it's a pretty straightforward step, but it's not easy because it requires surrender. And that's tough. So let me invite you to surrender your life to Jesus. Something like this. I'll pray aloud and you pray silently if it makes sense to you. Lord Jesus, I believe that I'm a sinner who needs a Savior. The Holy Spirit has been working and convincing me that I need to get right with God. I know I'm not, and and I know I can't get there by myself. I believe that you came to the cross so that I could come to you. So Jesus, I come to you now, and I ask you to forgive me and to change me from the inside out. Make me new. Make me that new creation the Bible talks about. I trust you. And I want to walk with you. I want to live with you, knowing your leadership in all of my life. In Jesus' name. And while heads are bowed and eyes are closed, if you just prayed that, and that's a, and that's a new step for you, would you raise your hand and look my way? I want to be praying for you this week as we, I, I know, I believe that God is doing something great and it will be a new week for you. So if you just prayed that and it's the first time you've ever done something like that, raise your hand and look my way. I want to be praying for you this week. Amen. Amen. Most of us have made that decision. We know with assurance that the Lord has saved us. We're not wishing, we're not hoping, we're confident in his salvation. We've received the grace of God, but perhaps the Holy Spirit has convicted you this morning to be a conduit of the grace of God, to allow the grace of God to flow through you in ways that you haven't yet 
Commit it to the Lord. Father God, thank you for the example of Barnabas, of grace flowing freely through his life and boosting others, blessing others, encouraging and strengthening others, restoring others. Help us to follow that example and allow your grace to flow through us We want to see the change in others. And we want to continue to change and become more like Jesus. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Bob, if you and those who are serving would come and join me here as we uh, prepare for communion. This is a time when the Apostle Paul says we should examine our hearts. Allow the Holy Spirit to examine your heart and give you instruction. This is not... A time when we say, oh, I'm not qualified to take communion. No, if you're a follower of Jesus, you're, you're qualified to take communion. It is a time to listen to the Holy Spirit and allow him to say, and here's where you can adjust the course a little bit. And then commit it to the Lord and receive communion. Go ahead and serve the body.
Thank you, Lord, that you have patiently waited for us. <clears throat> you gave long before we were ready to receive, ready to respond. And you are patient and gracious. Lord, we come to you and we acknowledge that we have needed you much longer than we knew. We're grateful, Lord, for this gift which reminds us of your great grace. Reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. As we take the bread, we want to remember those who are in need physically. If you have a physical need in your body and you want the healing touch of God, I invite you to stand right where you are and then we'll pray and receive this bread together. And I think of those who aren't here and if you'd like to stand for somebody who's not here, go ahead and do so and we'll, we'll pray. We'll pray for Jeff Moore, waiting for a lung transplant, for Cash uh, Krashnik, uh, with the degeneration of his spine, his back, needs a healing touch. For Pam Scroggins, who is in considerable pain with uh, uh, deterioration of her spine and lots of problems there. Uh, for Ron Meyer, who's in the hospital and, and um, being checked out for a variety of things, including Parkinson's, needing physical touch. God is the God who heals. Lord, we believe that Jehovah Rapha was not simply a name that you had in the past. It is still your name today. You are the God who heals. We bring these requests that we've named Everyone who stands is representing some need of healing, whether in their own body or for somebody else. You know exactly what each one needs, and you are able. We know that. We believe that. We proclaim it. You are able to heal physical bodies. We pray that you would do so for your glory, that you would reveal your power and your love through the grace of healing. In Jesus' name. Now we thank you for this bread, which reminds us that we can pray for this very thing. We can come to you boldly, knowing that you have provided for us, for body and soul. Thank you for this bread. Thank you, Jesus, that you sacrificed your body to make ours whole. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's take the bread together. And you may be seated. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. Father, thank you for seeing our need and providing the answer. Jesus, thank you for accepting the assignment and allowing your blood to be spilt where ours should have. We receive your forgiveness. We confess our need, and we receive your forgiveness. We give you thanks. Let's take the cup together. And then Paul writes, Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. He's coming back. He's coming back for us. Let's live ready. Let's be ready. <clears throat> because when the trumpet sounds, is not the time to think, about, think it over and make a decision. When the trumpet sounds, it's time to go. So if that happens today, let's be ready. If it happens down the road somewhere, let's be ready. Stand with me, will you? Romans 15, 13. You fill in the missing word when I pause. May the God of fill you with all and as you trust in him so that you may with I wish we were more confident at that point <clears throat> confident hope or hope if you're using the NIV by the power of the Holy Spirit it is by the power of the Holy Spirit that we have confident hope in the almighty God who saves us God bless have a great day